Last Sunday, the church on earth had the blessed privilege of celebrating the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on God's people and the church on earth began. On this Sunday, we have the privilege now of beginning a series of Sundays in which we see what life is like in God's kingdom. And on this Sunday, with the church on earth, we celebrate the truth of the Holy Trinity, a truth we cannot understand, but a truth that is ours by faith. And it's my prayer that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit increases your faith in Him and your confidence in Him as the God of your salvation as you worship the Trinity in unity and the unity in Trinity this morning. A good morning and welcome to all of you. If you're worshiping with us virtually, please send me a text message or email message. That information is useful to me. We'll join in singing the first hymn, 483. We'll stand for the singing of the fourth and final stanza.
our gracious Father in heaven, has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. And there was morning, the third day. 
And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living thing with which the water teems, and that moves about in it, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. The word of the Lord. The psalm of the day is number 8a. We'll listen as the organ plays an introduction, and then we'll join together in singing the refrain and the verses of the psalm. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. 
Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. And the grace be to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated. Children, I've got a message I've prepared for you. Come on up in the, the front here this morning. Let's sit over here on this side. I have a couple of things I want to show you today. It's good to see all of you. Did you hear what Jesus just said a little while ago? He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Some of our members, our young children, were baptized at this font right here, like some of you. Others were baptized at another font like that one or at home. And on that day, the pastor or someone else, probably the pastor though, took water and poured it on your head I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Oh, what a day. In a way, it's bigger than your birthday. Because on that day, you became a child of God forever. Wow. But that teaching, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hmm. And yet we don't worship three gods. We only worship one God. How can that be if he's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, well, we can think about it all day long. You can think about it for the rest of your life and you'll never figure it out because our brains can't think about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being only one God. But we can try to understand it by various things. Like here's a braid of three different colors, you see? It's one braid, right? It's a bookmark, one braid, but it's got three different colors to it, green and gold and white. Maybe you could think of green as the Father, gold as the Son, and the Holy Spirit as white. And yet, this doesn't quite explain who the true God is. We can't understand it. But we believe it. That's amazing, isn't it? What we can't understand our God causes us to believe. So you're going to go out throughout your life, you'll never understand fully how God can be three persons but one God. But you know this, Jesus died on the cross, right? for all of your sins. Because every day, you and I do things that God is not happy with. Call them sins. We argue, or we don't obey, or we don't listen. Or we're selfish. Yeah. Or you get angry when you shouldn't. Jesus forgives every sin. And then he died, he rose again. Wow. So that you and I can have eternal life with him. You know that and believe that. That's what makes you a child of God. And every day we rejoice in that. Okay, you go back and sing with your parents. We'll join in singing the hymn of the day, number 586. It's one of the oldest hymns among Christians.
Along with all Christians, we worship the Trinity in unity and the unity in Trinity. Grace from God the Father, love from God the Son, and fellowship with God the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Let's admit it. We like the familiarity of our worship practices. We like to know what's coming, what we're supposed to say and sing, and when we're supposed to listen. We like that we can wake up on a Sunday morning and know that when we get to church that morning, we're not going to be led in worship by a clown or a popular politician or some entertainer. We know what we're going to get, and we like that. We like that we know what we're going to hear and what we're going to speak. We like that we know we're going to hear God's word. We like that we know that at the beginning of the service, we're going to hear the name of the triune God and we'll hear it once again. Those are the last words we'll hear. We like that we're going to say our thanks be to the Lord, our amens, and our Lord's prayer. We like that. It's what we're used to. It's what we're comfortable with. It's what we enjoy. But does familiarity breed contempt? Do those words roll off our lips without any thought behind them? Are the words that we hear just words that go to the back of our minds as we're thinking about other things like, hey, what's for dinner today? What am I going to do this afternoon? Or what do I got on my plate for the next seven days? Are they just words that float into our ears and sit in the back of our minds and that's it? Today we celebrate with the Christian church on earth, the Holy Trinity, the fact that our God is three persons, but only one God. That is the truth, as I mentioned, that you heard at the beginning of this service, and those are the last words you will hear at the end of the service, and there's reason for that, good reason for that. It's been that way for nearly 2,000 years in the church, not because this is some trite formula, but because there is power. Power in the triune God. And on this Sunday, we hear the triune God blessing us with that power. The power of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Trinity blesses us with power. As Christians who sometimes feel like we're flagging, like we don't have what it takes to keep going. Those are welcomed words, aren't they? Power. Let's see what Jesus means here as he speaks these words to us in Matthew chapter 28. There's an adage which states, well begun is half done. In other words, if your beginning goes well, because you've put in time and preparation ahead of time, and you make a great beginning, then you're halfway there. You're halfway to being done. A good beginning is half done. If you were pondering the words, the opening words of our text, then that adage probably did not come to mind. Because at first glance, it doesn't appear like a good beginning was happening at all. Remember what we read? Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Panic! These are some of the final days that Jesus is spending on this earth in visible form. Some of the final moments he will have with his disciples. And some believed, praise God, but some doubted? You call that a good beginning? I call that reason for panic. Jesus is about to hand over the kingdom to his disciples. It's going to be up to them. His work is finished. It's complete. He's going to pour out the Holy Spirit on them, and then he's going to send them out. And some doubted? Well, let's make sure we understand what's happening here. Yes, Matthew mentions the 11 disciples, but remember also that on the day of Easter, Jesus told the women who were the first ones to see him, you go ahead of me to Galilee. He told others of his believers, go ahead of me into Galilee. I don't think we can limit to who is here to the 11 disciples. In fact, many good Bible commentators believe this is the event up there north in Galilee 
Perhaps, uh, it says here on a mount, perhaps at the very same mountain where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. It's the event that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he states that he appeared alive to 500 brothers at the same time. There may have been multitudes of people there, not just the 11. Some worshipped him, some doubted. Doubted not that he rose from the dead, but likely that this was really Jesus. Huh? Well, that's exactly what occurred on Easter. More than once, they saw Jesus risen from the dead, but they just didn't understand. They didn't know it was him. That could have been the case. Whatever the case, Jesus then responds in what might have been a make or break moment for the church on earth with these words. Words, not a miracle, words. Words about the triune God. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. There you have it. He didn't let them consider for a moment that what was about to happen over the next few decades really was only up to them. That it was make or break time for them because it was all up to them now. It's all on you. If anybody is going to come to faith, it's going to be all up to you. No, 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 Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The, the work of making disciples wasn't on them. The work of making those disciples was on Jesus. And he had all authority. All authority to accomplish what he wanted to be done. There is no opposition to him that can possibly overcome him. There is nothing beyond his control. There, nothing happens outside of his knowledge. In fact, he knew in eternity it was going to happen. It's all there. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. You talk about power. And every one of them was familiar with that work. He wasn't asking them to do anything that had already happened to them. During the three years of his ministry, Jesus had made them his disciples by teaching to them and preaching to them. That's exactly what he was telling his disciples to go out to do. Now go and do the same for others. Do what I have done for you. Make copies of yourself, in other words. Go do it, because I'm going with you. In fact, he says at the very end of this text, some very, very comforting words. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Yes. In what was likely just a few days, Jesus would visibly ascend into heaven from a different mountain, one near Jerusalem. But he wasn't leaving them. He was going to go with them. He wasn't sending them out on his own, on their own. He was going out with them. He would be with them every step of the way. He would be right beside them every time they spoke a single word. He was going with them as the triune God. The Holy Trinity blesses us with power. The power of his command, go and make disciples of all nations. And that's what the triune God still does. He blesses us with a command, a powerful command, go and make disciples of all nations. What's your reaction to that? A few weeks ago, I read a review by an American military expert of the Russian army and its efforts to conquer Ukraine. And that has failed to this point for quite a few reasons. And one of them is, supposedly, the Russian military, before the war began, went into Russian prisons and told prisoners, look, you can stay here if you want. Your provisions will be cut. or." You can go into battle, and we'll make sure your provisions continue. In fact, if uh, you get out of the war and we win, we'll probably set you free. So a bunch of prisoners took them up on their offer. Untrained men with a lack of motivation, you might say, at least a motivation that's in their heart to the glory of Russia. It's a recipe for disaster from a military standpoint, and that's exactly what is happening. Now Jesus is going to send out his apostles, apostles who have a rather checkered past. 
It wasn't the, only some of these ones who were gathered there on this day that doubted. Remember the track record of the apostles? They doubted him constantly. Even his own mother doubted him and his ministry at one point. The one who had heard from the lips of Gabriel, the angel himself, prior to her conception, this is going to be the savior of the world. And at one point in that savior's ministry, maybe three decades later, she doubted it. That's what happens. But those are the people Jesus is going to be sending out into the world. Isn't this a recipe for disaster? Not at all. Because unlike the Russian army, Jesus equips his soldiers, his disciples, absolutely, perfectly. He gives them the means to accomplish that work. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Baptizing and teaching. There you have it. The miracle of faith being worked in the heart of a sinful person is not our own doing. It is the work of the Almighty God himself through his word. At your baptism, likely your pastor, poured water over your head in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as he called you by name. You know, there have been many times in my life when I wish that almost 62 years ago my parents had had the ability to record video and audio my baptism. As my pastor said, Joel, Robert, Voss, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There it is. Wow. Someone who had belonged to Satan's kingdom up to that point, now a member of the kingdom of God, a miracle. I like to watch that video every time my faith is in doubt. Every time I'm feeling down about work in the kingdom. Ha, there's a miracle. But truth be told, I don't need a video to, to convince me of that, and neither do you. The fact is, you were baptized in the name of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. On that day, he worked saving faith in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in your heart. That's the means that we have of making disciples of all nations. We go out with baptism and with the teaching. Jesus said, teaching them everything I have commanded you, everything. There is no insignificant teaching of Jesus Christ. There is no teaching of Jesus that we ought to conveniently hide under the cover of our Bibles. Whatever Jesus has said, has told us, has taught us, that's what we need to go with because that, the truth, is what converts souls and strengthens faith in Christ. What we need to make disciples, Jesus has given us. The triune God blesses us with power, a powerful command accompanied by powerful means. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. A powerful command and a powerful means. Think about it. Just a few days after this event in our text, the Holy Spirit is poured out on these disciples. Peter preaches a sermon of law and gospel, pointed law and gospel. He cuts the people to the heart and then shares with them the saving news of Jesus Christ and tells them to be baptized. And 3,000 were baptized that day and added to the church. The church exploded. A powerful command with powerful means. Jesus gave his disciples on this day that powerful command and those powerful means, and Jesus still gives his disciples that powerful command with powerful means. That's us. But what's our reaction? Well, it seems to be a lose in its power. At least here in our own country, we're losing members, losing churches, they're closing. Every day there are attacks on what the church believes, teaches, and confesses, and it seems to be gaining strength. The opposition of the church is growing, not dissipating. It doesn't seem so powerful at all, does it? But it has exactly the power Jesus wants it to have. He will accomplish his saving work through us. The question is whether you'll get to it or not. Whether I will. 
Well, I, whether I will receive with faith the command Jesus has given me and then in faith use the gifts that Jesus has given me, sacrament and word, to accomplish it. That's all he gives, but that's everything we need. And you have it. By grace, it's yours. So let's look for, to our Heavenly Father for forgiveness for our woe is me attitude about what's going on in the church. Receive the forgiveness of Christ and the power of his resurrection that was in your baptism and is yours today. Be the disciples that the Holy Trinity wants us to be. The Holy Trinity blesses us with power, the power to make disciples. Let's go. Let's go with a powerful command and with a powerful means. Amen. Please stay. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing the Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This past week, the Lord called home to himself in heaven the soul of Lisa Hendershot, the niece of Lou and Karen Ledke, after her battle with cancer. Lisa was in her early 40s and leaves behind her husband and two children. Nick and Hillary Hirth request that we join them in prayers of thanks to the Lord for granting success to the cancer treatments of their friend, Megan. True God, you are the one eternal God whose name we praise forever. We would not have known you if you have not revealed yourself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, yet one God. Remove from us all doubt and grant us humble faith as we contemplate this high and holy mystery. Enlighten and empower us to worship you as the triune God, the Holy Trinity. God, our Father, whatever good is in us, whatever good things we have, and whatever good we do comes from you alone. In you we live and move and have our being. Open our eyes to see the gifts you provide every day, purely out of your own love and care. Lord Jesus, our Savior, you came into the world to make the Father known to us. You joined yourself to us by taking on our humanity and brought us back to God by shedding your blood. In love, you walked the way of suffering and carried the wrath of God that we deserved because of our sins. Help us believe that all you did and all you endured, you did to rescue us and set us free. In the bright new hope of your resurrection, teach us to offer our lives in praise to God and in love to our neighbor. Creator Spirit, you breathed into us new life by the power of the gospel, opened our eyes to see the light of your grace, and filled our minds with the clear sound of your voice. Through word and sacrament, lead us to understand more completely how broad and deep and high is the love of God in Christ Jesus. Firm up our resolve to do battle with Satan and sin. In every weakness be our strength, that we may show ourselves to be God's children, faithful in prayer, constant in hope, and fervent in love. O oh Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believers, Lisa Hendershot, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought her to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the body rest, and together with us all, a resurrection to eternal life. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved. O God, the giver of life, health, safety, and strength, 
We praise for you for having granted Megan recovery from her cancer. May she daily remember your great goodness, that she may serve you with a life that reflects genuine thankfulness for all your blessings, for the blessings of medical care, and for the competent care that she received. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Holy Trinity, you are the God of glory, the God of grace, and the God of all comfort. We rejoice to call you Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and praise your holy name forever. Amen. Please be seated for the offering. Forgiven, free of guilt and shame, grant me some time to render a gift to glorify your name, love to reflect your splendor. This world must know what I have learned, that you bestow what none has earned, the joy of full forgiveness. Amen. We'll continue with the singing of the next hymn, number 606.
salvation. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through, your, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We depart now with the blessing of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn. Joining me in praising the God of our salvation, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a God that we can never completely figure out. But that's exactly the kind of God we need, a God who's bigger than us, bigger than our problems, bigger than the issues we face. He's infinitely greater, and he's the God of your salvation. Praise him for it. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, number one today is the final day that the Catchpole family will be with us before they move to Colorado Springs in order for Marcus to continue his military career at the Military Academy. We wish them all of God's speed and God's blessings. You've been a true blessing to us. We pray that you'll be a blessing to your new congregation wherever you may land. Also, June 25th, uh, missionary Matthew Bamer will be here in worship with us, uh, one of our Wells missionaries, and then has offered to make a presentation after worship. The elders will supply pizza free to eat while he makes his presentation. I've been told that he's one of the finest mission presenters in our synod. It's going to be a real treat. He's going to talk about how we reach out to the people in Latin America. We saw it in the video, the Wells Connection video last month, uh, an explosion like the Pentecost Day, an explosion of people who are hearing the truth of God's word through us, through you, through the, uh, what you make available to them by the offerings that you give. Join us. Make plans to join us. Sunday the 25th, not for an hour or two, just for a while, and enjoy pizza and hearing that message. I'm sure you're going to be enlightened and also uh, pleased with what our synod's doing through you and through the offerings you give. Have a blessed day. Um.